Thank you for joining us today as we begin VIU's 2016-2017 Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series here in the newly renovated Malaspina Theater. After 40 years, I think we can all stand a little bit of work, and I must say that the theater has never looked better. Hearty congratulations to theater chair Leon Potter and all those who were part of this wonderful project to renovate the theater. We uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. Please be mindful as well that whenever and wherever we are gathered on this beautiful campus and the greater Nanaimo area, we are on the traditional territory of the Sunemo First Nation. And you may see some people wearing orange shirts today. That, of course, is in recognition, a remembrance, again, of the residential school uh, legacy. Um, so please keep that in mind. I'm Dr. Tim Lewis, Chair of the VIU History Department and a member of the Arts and Humanities Planning uh, Committee. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to once again be serving as event moderator for the colloquium series. Eight years ago, the colloquium was founded as a means of showcasing to those across campus and in the community at large the amazing work and research conducted by members of VIU's Arts and Humanities faculty. It has been a highly successful in initiative but one that would never have succeeded without the support and cooperation of large numbers of people, including theater, faculty, and staff, the dozens of arts and humanities faculty who have generously shared their work and time with us, and you, our faithful audience. Special recognition must also go to Dr. Ross McKay and all those in the Office of the Dean of Arts and Humanities. The colloquium series could not continue without the crucial moral and financial support they provide. VIU President and Vice Chancellor Dr. Ralph Nielsen has also been a prominent advocate for the colloquium, and we are delighted that he is able to join us this morning to help us launch our 2016-2017 season. Dr. Nielsen. Well, thank you very much, Tim, and I too would like to acknowledge around the traditional territory of the Sinemuk people and have enjoyed the wonderful 80-year relationship that uh, has, has uh, evolved and developed as a result of this institution starting in 1936 uh, right here in Nanaimo and uh, continuing to evolve to be the incredibly dynamic place it is today with uh, you know, just a, a phenomenally uh, committed group of people that continue to support and uh, ensure that this institution is contributing the way that it can. And I, I can't think of a better example when I wander around this country, I wander around this uh, province, or I wander around this community, or indeed even the world, to t than to talk about the Arts and Humanities Colloquium and the university taking the responsibility it has to ensure that it's engaging with community and having the kind of conversations and providing the opportunities and the portals for people to engage. I too want to acknowledge Ross McKay and uh, his persistence. Um, Ross has been a, a wonderfully gentle but persistent uh, dean in terms of ensuring that we continue to move forward. Um, he's had a lot of help from his faculty who are equally as persistent, and that's why we've got these phenomenal uh, seats uh, in the uh, theater today to ensure that uh, we continue. You know, 40 years is a long time, but fortunately we're here, and we've uh, managed to provide the kind of seats so that when we do have speakers up here, they're not interrupted constantly by the squeaking of the chairs or the uh, people falling through their chairs or whatever, whatever has happened over the years. So it's a, it's a great joy. So we really appreciate that. And I, I do want to acknowledge uh, somebody who's no longer with us, but Mike Tower was also incredibly persistent and patient in terms of pushing that forward. And we're so appreciative of his recognition of the importance of moving this forward. I want to thank the Arts and... I also want to thank the Arts and Humanities Colloquium um, group. The committee has been uh, together for eight years now, and it, it, probably a little longer than that, but have provided the incredible support for us as a community by uh, offering up to this community themselves and uh, in their colleagues uh, to bring forward conversation pieces and indeed some incredibly important intellectual uh, opportunities to engage in the work that, uh, that uh, various individuals uh, do. And time and time and time again, the conversations that come out of here add to more conversations and more conversations and more questions being asked, which is exactly what we should be doing at a university, is being forced to think so that then we ask more questions and forced to 
think about ourselves within the context, not only this institution, but the communities that we serve. Um, I want to uh, thank the BIU's research, uh, uh, Media Research Lab for the filming of today, because I know that's being done. I want to thank all the faculty, staff, students who are here today, and of course, all of the community supporters that continue to come and, and participate uh, in our, in our uh, series. So thank you very much for that. And I'm really honored to be uh, uh, here again today to, to uh, kick off the series. I appreciate the invitation. Um, as uh, university president, it's, uh, you know, we, we have many, many opportunities to be involved in, in, in different things representing the institution. But I have to say, when we think about this evolving institution and how this uh, whole initiative that has been started by the arts and humanities faculty has started and, and what's evolving, uh, it it's can't be a better testament than this to what we as an institution are evolving to in terms of, again, my, I repeat myself, but the responsibility to our communities. We became a university, full university in 2008. Incredible amount of intellectual activity be, been going on at this institution for a long period of time. But you know, to have the confidence as a community to say, we want everybody to come in and participate with us in this kind of thinking. We're willing to put ourselves on stage. We're willing to put ourselves out there. And we want you to engage in the kind of dialogue that we know can happen as a result of this kind of uh, uh, back and forth conversation. So I, I really do want to thank the arts and humanities faculty for what they've done in showing their leadership and helping uh, us move forward as an institution to really take the responsibility that's been provided us by, by becoming a, a university. I also, I also want to recognize the Encore campaign. Uh, the Encore campaign was a, was a program that was initiated to help us replace these seats. And I know there's an awful lot of people that are in the theater today who have stepped up and helped by buying seats, by making contributions. And I want to say thank you to each and every one of you and all your colleagues and all of our community members who have helped us uh, with this transition. These kind of crowdsourcing campaigns are brand new for the university. We did one previously with the whale bones up at the Deep Bay Field Station. This was the second one. And it really demonstrates to us how important, again, our institution, our environment, and our learning environment is to all of us. And, and uh, once again, the community has stepped up and really helped us move forward to ensure that we have the kind of spaces that we can be very proud of, uh, not only for us internally, but for our community. And it, uh, in an era when uh, money is extremely tight, we so appreciate the kind of support and recognition by our community and people stepping up to help us. So thank you to each and every one of us, uh, uh, to each and every one of you. Uh, for that. I know that this is a, a start of a series of six uh, presentations again for this year. Um, I'm, I'm planning, I've got them in my schedule, I'm trying to be at every one of them that I, that I possibly can be at and try and arrange my schedule so I will be here on Fridays to be able to participate. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Laura's, which is uh, Cramner's, which is coming uh, October 21st and, and that'll be uh, very, very enjoyable. And uh, I think Wade Compton is doing the one on November, is it 20? Um, 25th, November 25th. Uh, so that should be a, an, an awful lot of fun uh, indeed in, in, in that one as well. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not, it's about Wade Compton. My fault, my fault. It's about Wade Compton, it's Paul. And I've met Paul. Paul, sorry about that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's Paul Watkins' uh, presentation on November 25th. Um, I also want to mention that uh, Historically, when we look back over, over time, um, it was uh, Katarina Rout and Helen Brown. I, I, I want to mention both of these individuals because of the work that they did in, in, an, in the sort of inaugural times of, of putting all this together. Both have been so committed and continue to be committed to the institution. And even though they don't spend as much time on campus, they still spend an awful lot of time on campus and, and helping us as a community. And I want to recognize each of them for their continued support, their continued efforts, and indeed their commitment to this institution and, and indeed to the colloquium series. Uh, so thank you to both of you. You know, there's no question that our community is, uh, is enriched by, by both of these individuals, and, uh, and uh, I can't say enough about uh, how much I appreciate the work that they do. So I'm really looking forward to Cynthia's presentation today. I, I just had a quick uh, chat with her. It was a, a, a very interesting for me to uh, pick up the book this spring. 
because this is not a, a book that I would normally read, uh, I have to say. When I, I usually have two or three books on the go, they're on my bedside, and, I, and this one, you know, it's, I find it much easier to watch a TV show because I don't have to get quite as in-depth and understand all the moving pieces. And so this one is, uh, was a challenge, well, I, I won't say, a ch yeah, it was a challenge for me because I, when, many times I like light reading when I'm, uh, when I'm reading, and uh, this one was, was, for me, anything but that. But it was also very, very enjoyable in terms of uh, the smiles and chuckles I got as I, as I went through. So I'm really looking forward to the talk today and, and uh, a little bit more in-depth explanation of, uh, of Cynthia's work. Again, it's one of the opportunities that I really celebrate about being challenged to think in a way that I don't normally think and challenged to be participate in something that I don't no normally participate in. Uh, and here I am at an institution where I've, I'm uh, given the privilege and opportunity to spend a couple hours and listen and think in a way that I'm not normally uh, engaged. So I really look forward to Cynthia's presentation and I, I really look forward to uh, uh, the opportunity to engage in conversation afterward with everybody uh, on, the, on what we heard and what we're talking about. So with that, I'm going to pass this back to uh, Tim and uh, say thank you very much for inviting me to participate today and thank you to each and every one of you for the support that you're providing to Vancouver Island University through this series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nielsen, for that warm welcome and your ongoing supports of our efforts. We greatly appreciate the many times that you highlight our work and t for you taking the time to be with us this morning. And now, please welcome Dr. Marnie Stanley from our VIU's Departments of English and Women's Studies as she will introduce today's feature speaker, Dr. Cynthia Masson, who will be taking us on a journey into the wonderful and mysterious world of medieval alchemy, and will also share with us the even more mysterious tale of how she has successfully transformed an academic paper into a fantasy novel trilogy. Interesting stuff. Dr. Stanley. Welcome. Honeybees, and both their necessity to human culture and their vulnerability, form one of the connective threads in Cynthia's new novel, The Alchemist's Council. If I think of the English department as a hive, with our members flitting about in the flowers of our research, and you'll have to indulge my botanical metaphor here, then Cynthia chooses the most esoteric, literally, as you are about to see, flowers. In the work world of actual bees, one pound of honey requires 1,152 bees to travel 112,000 miles and visit 4.5 million flowers. In the work world of the English department hive, Cynthia is a very productive bee. <laughs> Some years ago, I had the pleasure of co-authoring a paper with Cynthia, and she came to our first meeting with 35 pages of notes for an assignment to write a 10-page paper. No relevant flower goes unexplored in her garden. It is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Cynthia Masson, who, like the honeybee, will bring us sweetness and light. Nothing illuminates like knowing, or like unknowing, as you are about to see. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cynthia Masson. Thank you, and thank you for coming today. I will be talking about alchemy and my scholarly work with alchemical texts and the alchemical concepts out of which I developed my novel, The Alchemist Council. But first, I will welcome you to the world of council dimension by reading a paragraph from the novel's preface. From the end of the crystalline wars through the thousands of years leading to the current era of Arrhenius, only those alchemists initiated to council ever become true masters of alchemy. For the uninitiated, alchemy remains shrouded, a mystery both arcane and exquisitely beautiful, visible yet hidden amidst the pages of ancient manuscripts, inscribed with meticulously inked calligraphy, illuminated with the vibrancy of gemstones and gold. Only the privileged few of the outside world lay hand to such manuscripts, 
scholars in pursuit of knowledge and unique theories. But even these few are so far removed from the truth of alchemy that not a single alchemist has ever taken an alchemical scholar seriously. One or two of the privileged may glimpse a fragment of truth if, for example, such a scholar were to observe British Library Manuscript Additional 5025 at precisely the right moment on the right day. But even then, such a scholar would most likely attribute the apparent movement of the silver dragon to a fatigue-induced illusion rather than to the ceremonial rites of the Alchemist Council. Picture an alchemist. What do you see? Perhaps you imagine an old man in his laboratory attempting to concoct the elixir of life everlasting. Or perhaps, thanks to J.K. Rowling, you connect alchemy to the philosopher's stone, the mystical object that bestows upon the alchemist nearly unlimited powers over the elements. Bryce Raffle, an early reviewer of the Alchemist Council, certainly noted the connections with Harry Potter. Here's a screenshot of a short section of a much longer review that will also provide you with a basic plot overview. You're a wizard, Harry. You're an alchemist, Jaden. It's an intelligently written, character-driven fantasy novel. The Alchemist Council is Harry Potter for adults. No, you won't be seeing Kidditch within these pages, but still, the similarities are really not so disparate. Harry heads off to Hogwarts each year to study wizardry. He secretly sneaks about the halls at night to meet with his friends as they look into a possible plot to bring back the Dark Lord. Spoiler alert, Jaden is spirited away to Council Dimension, where she studies alchemy. She sneaks about the halls at night in order to meet with Arjan, and, like Harry and his friends, even sneaks into the library to read the banned books section. She's also investigating a possible rebel branch plot to bring back a banished council member. See what I mean? Other aspects of the plot will come into play as we progress over the next 50 minutes, but for now, simply recognize that the 101 members of the Alchemist Council control the world by manipulating ancient manuscripts. And another group of alchemists, called the Rebel Branch, wants to stop the council. These two branches vie for Jaden's allegiance. Bryce Raffles' comparison is welcomed, who wouldn't want her book to be marketed as the Harry Potter for adults. However, the alchemy of the Alchemist Council moves beyond basic magical lore into the complexities of alchemy to which I will briefly introduce you now. At its core, alchemy is about transformation, transmuting one thing into another, lead into gold, for example. But early scholars of alchemical texts, such as E.J. Homyard, described alchemy as having a twofold nature, which he termed exoteric and esoteric, or practical and spiritual. Exoteric alchemy involves the physical aspects of the process, the equipment and recipes meant to guide the alchemist in the quest to create the philosopher's stone or to turn base metals into precious metals. In the Alchemist Council, to represent this practical aspect of alchemy, I have included laboratory scenes such as the one in which Jaden, as an initiate, succeeds for the first time at turning lead into gold. Esoteric alchemy involves the mystical aspects of the process, the steps to be taken by the alchemist toward transformation of the body and soul on a spiritual level through divine grace. In the Alchemist Council, to represent this spiritual aspect of alchemy, I include repeated references to the Council's goal to ascend to a divine state known as the One. These overarching concepts form the alchemical framework from which I constructed the novel. More specific concepts will be explored as we progress. In Europe, interest in alchemy flourished between the 14th and 17th centuries. As a result, thousands of medieval and early modern manuscripts still exist. This slide is a screenshot of a Google search for alchemy manuscripts. And as you can see from looking at the images, alchemy is extraordinarily detailed and complicated. 
For first-time readers trying to make sense of the subject, alchemy can be a frustrating experience. As de, Pascala put, de, de Pascalis puts it, enigmas, contradictions, allegories, symbols, interruptions, veiled meanings, and apparent absurdities are enough to make even the most indefatigable neophyte wonder if he is not the victim of some bizarre joke. And certain medieval alchemists would have agreed with de Pascalis. This illustration is from a 17th century collection featuring a 15th century work called The Ordinal of Alchemy by Thomas Norton. Norton, an English alchemist and writer, claims that he'll write in common language because other alchemical texts are so confusing. And this short passage that I'm about to show you from Norton's 3,000 line poem is written in Middle English, but or late Midi Mid Middle English, but I'll read it with modern pronunciation and where necessary translation for ease of comprehension. All masters which write of this solemn work, they made their books to many men full dark in poems, parables, and in metaphors also, which to scholars causeth pain and woe. As a scholar of medieval alchemy, I'd have to agree with Norton. So just to give you a bit of my academic background, my PhD focused on Middle English medieval literature with a dissertation on the works of the English mystics. Whereas my Shirk postdoctoral fellowship focused on Middle English medieval alchemical poetry, specifically the works of Thomas Norton, Geoffrey Chaucer, and George Ripley. The postdoc also involved a few months at the British Library studying medieval and early modern manuscripts, including the one featured at the opening of the presentation and here. What I came to appreciate during that work was the utter beauty of these manuscripts, more of which will be featured as we progress. Along the way, I also consulted a number of scholarly and general books on alchemy, which as this slide suggests are plentiful, and all of these books are currently available should you wish to explore this subject further later on. Out of this postdoctoral research and reading came my academic articles on alchemy. As you might guess from their titles, just take a look at that for a minute. <laughs> these articles, like most scholarly articles, have a very limited audience. Yet the subject matter, the concepts of alchemy, are utterly fascinating. And one day here at VIU, I asked my students in a medieval literature class during a unit on alchemy whether they would read a novel based on the ideas we were discussing. And they responded with a resounding yes, and thus began the journey from academic article to fantasy novel. And as far as I can tell, the novel gained more readers in two months than all the articles put together in the last decade. So what I want to explore now are the ways my academic work as a medievalist influenced the construction of the fantasy world of the Alchemist Council. Before discussing how I used specific alchemical concepts in the book, I want to discuss a few other medieval works that influenced aspects of the Alchemist Council, in particular Pearl and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. But I had to laugh. Oh, as you can see from the 1968 edition that we have here of Sir Gawain, the editor is J.R.R. Tolkien. And I had to laugh when I was searching for these images and came across this one, which makes it look like Tolkien wrote these poems. <laughs> he did not. These long Middle English poems were both written by the same anonymous author in the 14th century, but Tolkien was a scholar of medieval literature who went on to write fantasy novels, so precedent exists. <clears throat> Pearl and Gawain influenced what I consider a key component of the Alchemist Council philosophy. Pearl is an allegory that at the beginning features a pearl without a spot the arrow points to the Middle English words with uten spot. In other words, a perfect object 
without a flaw. As the poem progresses, the narrator realizes that as an imperfect human, unlike the pearl, he is flawed. A similar realization occurs in Sir Gawain when our hero returns to King Arthur's court wearing a green sash to symbolize imperfection. These basic concepts gave me one of the central ideas of the Alchemist Council, to include a flaw within the philosopher's stone. The flaw in the stone, as I named it, ensures human individuality, including imperfection. Cedar could see it if she gazed to the left as the angle of light fell onto the lapis from the northwest window of the scriptorium just before dusk, the flaw in the stone, the fleck of absence within alchemical, per within alchemical perfection that prevented absolute permanent union. The alchemists want to perfect the stone and thereby ascend to the divine perfection, whereas the rebels want to increase the flaw to ensure that everyone remains an earthbound, imperfect individual. Both Pearl and Sir Gawain have 101 stanzas. 100 stanzas would have represented perfection. The one in 101 represents imperfection. Thus, there are 101 members of the Alchemist Council. Another influence on the novel was The Cloud of Unknowing, a 14th century mystical text to open his work, the anonymous author enthusiastically begs his reader, I charge thee and I beseech thee not to read the book. The cloud author's plea influenced the novel's first line. The Alchemist Council forbids you to read this book. After a paragraph of begging, the cloud author explains that only certain people should read this book those who are most devout. This aspect of the cloud of unknowing influenced the final paragraph of the preface to the Alchemist Council, which I'll read to you now, even though I shouldn't, since the council forbids it. The intricacies of council dimension are visible only to those graced with the gift to see what is and what is not, to recognize both the ink and the page to comprehend with and without words, to perceive beyond thought the message inscribed herein. Brush with your fingertips these letters extolled by the alchemists, and you will know with a certainty you have never before attained whether you are worthy to turn the page. My general knowledge of medieval literature influenced various choices, but the book at its heart is about alchemy. And thus, medieval alchemical literature is the material that influenced the book most. Generally, what I did as I constructed the novel was repeatedly to take a specific alchemical concept and transform it, or transmute it alchemically, if you'd like, into part of my fictional world. And to illustrate this process, I've chosen six concepts from alchemy. <coughs> to show the different sorts of ways that I integrated alchemical material into the novel. For each one, I'll explain the concept and then read a passage from the novel in which that particular concept is central. I could have chosen to illustrate these concepts using Middle English poetry of Thomas Norton and George Ripley, but I decided visual representation from illuminated manuscripts seems the more reasonable choice for today's presentation. So the majority of the images you're about to see come from four 16th century works. This is the first one, the Rosarium Philosophorum, housed at the University of Glasgow. The Ripley Scrolls from the British Library. Splendor Solace, also from the British Library, and Amphitheatrum Sapientiae Eternae, or the Theatre of Eternal Wisdom, which is housed at the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, all of these images, though, are available online, so you're welcome to look at them in more detail later. First, the Prima Materia. 
Prima Materia is considered the unpurified material before the start of the alchemical operation. That is the material with which alchemists begin their work toward making the philosopher's stone. So I used the term prima materia instead of preface to open the novel. I'm not going to read this entire passage. I just want to show you the screenshot of the preface's first page and then read a few sentences. So prima materia. Long ago, so very long ago, that the truth of the matter now exists only as a primordial myth. The lapis and the flaw were co-equivalents, known in their conjunction as the calculus macula. Quintessence, the fifth and most sublime element, the very breath of life and life everlasting, flowed between the two in a harmony of such congruence that everything above and below naturally maintained perfect elemental balance. So in the case of the Alchemist Council then, the prima materia is the primordial myth or the origin myth of the world in which the book is set. In other words, this is where it all began. With other key concepts, such as the philosopher's stone, I wanted to distinguish between the alchemy of the outside world, that is, of our world, the type of alchemy I've been discussing with you thus far, and the distinct alchemy of the world of the Alchemist Council. To illustrate that sort of usage, that is the transformation of a major alchemical concept into my version of it, I'll read you another paragraph from the Prima Materia section. From the youngest of the initiates to the eldest of the elders, true alchemists, those of the Alchemist Council, have worked together through the centuries, not as is the common misperception, to produce the philosopher's stone. One cannot replicate the stone. It has always already existed as the lapis, the heart, the foundation, the divine manifestation responsible for the very fabric of council dimension. As the plot develops, the importance of the stone or the lapis as a central element of the story becomes abundantly clear. Whereas other key alchemical concepts I use only briefly, either to enhance the world or to add a magical quality to a specific scene. So an example of that would be my use of the emerald tablet. The Emerald Tablet is believed to be one of the oldest of all alchemical texts. I say believed to be the oldest because its origins are mythical. According to Diana Fernando, the tablet was allegedly found by Alexander the Great in the tomb of Hermes, who engraved on it 15 cryptic sentences. And as an aside here, I'll just mention that the connection with the Emerald Tablet to the Greek god Hermes is the reason that alchemy is often referred to as the hermetic arts. <clears throat> Alchemists believe these sentences hold the secrets to alchemical transformation. And just to give you a sample of the cryptic sentences, here are two, although you're welcome to read them all in the Latin if you're able to do so. That which is below is like that which is above, that which is above is like that which is below. The sun is its father, the moon its mother. You can begin to see in these two examples the importance of opposites in alchemy, which I'll be discussing in more details later. For now, I want to read another passage. Because alchemists because the Alchemist Council is a world in which ancient manuscripts hold the secrets of alchemical transmutation, I decided to use the Emerald Tablet as a means for alchemists to locate the manuscripts. Now in this next passage, the term card catalog is used. So in case you're too young to have ever used one, let's just say it was a method used in medieval times to find books in a library. Moments later, Jaden stood in front of the North Library's alchemical equivalent of a card catalog, a large rectangular piece of jade named the Emerald Tablet. Months ago at a library orientation, see I use my work sometimes too for this, 
Jaden had mistakenly assumed the catalog was the emerald tablet, the mythical tabula smaragdina, revered as the origin of alchemical texts by would-be and actual alchemists alike. But when she expressed this thought, the keeper of the book laughed, assuring her that this emerald tablet was a mere tool. Mere, relative to the tabula smaragdina perhaps, but it held the location data for every manuscript known to counsel, a supercomputer of sorts, powered by lapis rather than lithium. Jaden placed her hands on its surface, palms down with her index fingers and thumbs touching to form the flattened version of the ab uno gesture. Serpens chemicum 1414, she said aloud three times. Within seconds, a code glowed in gold on the jade screen, MS 50.2.7.9.4.NL. Jaden knew from her library training that this referred to 50th position, second shelf, seventh case, ninth division, fourth floor, north library. She jotted the code in a notebook and moved quickly to the stairs. Though still unfamiliar with the library compared to most alchemists, within 10 minutes, she had managed to locate the manuscript. Alchemical equipment is also an important element of council dimension. The classrooms serve in part as laboratories. One particular piece of equipment is the alembic, which in practical alchemy is used to distill substances. But it is also featured in images suggesting a means of purifying oneself. Thus, in the Alchemist Council, I decided to include a type of human alembic that is used for healing. In the passage I'm about to read, Jaden is searching in the underground catacombs for her friend Arjan, another initiate, and is recalling earlier incidents with a teacher named Linden and an elder named Obichi. The catacombs were dimly lit with small lanterns hanging at intervals along the complex web of pathways. Terrifying carvings designed to resemble human skulls lined the stone walls. Linden had expounded upon their symbolic intention. Each skull was a figurative memorial to death in the outside world, each carved into stone on the day its respective council member turned 30, received elixir, and thus officially renounced his or her former life for life everlasting. Someday a replica of Jaden's own skull would reside in these walls. She shuddered. She knew the catacombs housed eight alembics, all of which were used intermittently for healing. She need only find the one emitting light to find Arjan. But the catacombs were extensive, descending deep underground to the ancient wells. These same wells supplied the restorative channel waters that flowed through all of council dimension, but intensive healing transmutation was best achieved in the natural alembic baths near the well's source. Arjan's placement within a catacomb alembic, rather than merely a visit to the albedo waters for a recuperative bath, suggested the damage inflicted by Obichi had been extensive. His healing required the elemental minerals that seeped into the water from the walls and base of the natural alembics. Next, I would like to discuss the alchemical tree, or as it is sometimes called, the philosophical tree. This tree is often understood as representing the entire alchemical process, or as Lindy Abraham explains, the growth of gold and maturation of the philosopher's stone. It is also associated with alchemical wisdom, as in this quotation from Elias Ashmole's Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum. Plant this tree on the lapis that the birds of the sky come and reproduce on its branches. It is from there that wisdom rises. Images of trees are so prominent in alchemical manuscripts that I decided to name all the alchemists after trees. Some are obvious, such as cedar or laurel or even linden from the previous passage, but others require explanation. 
and of those I've chosen to use Drakane as an example. The characteristics of Dracaena cinnabari influenced plot decisions. The dragon's blood tree is named for its dark red resin known as dragon's blood. And as stated at archive.org, the dragon's blood resin exudes naturally from fissures and wounds in the bark and is commonly harvested by widening these fissures with a knife. This reference to the fissure enhanced my idea of the flaw in the stone, and therefore I used the name Dracane, as I pronounce it, for the leader of the rebel branch and for aspects of the flaw dimension, as the rebel world is called. And this passage from the book involves Jaden's first venture into this alternate dimension. Jaden peered cautiously into the cup. She accepted it and drew it cautiously toward her nose. It smelled fragrant like cinnamon and cardamom. It's a tonic of spiced wine infused with the essence of the dragon blood stone, said Kalina. Do you know of the dragon blood stone? No, replied Jaden. Kalina gestured towards a large alcove on the other side of the cave. Observe for yourself, said Dracane. Jaden walked to the alcove and peered over an intricately cast wrought iron structure that formed a barrier between the place where she stood and a deep open chamber. In the midst of the chamber was what appeared to be a much larger version of the stone Dracane had earlier held out to her by the cliff face. Do you recognize it, Kalina asked. She now stood beside Jaden. No, should I? It's the flaw in the stone. It exists simultaneously here and there. But the flaw is so small, just a fraction of the lapis. From your perspective, time and space are relative in council dimension. But I remember, Cedar showed me. She said the light must fall onto the lapis at a certain angle in order for the flaw to be seen at all. Yet here, said Dracane, it's all you can see. I also used the alchemical tree as an overarching concept in the Alchemist Council. In the following scene, Jaden is reacting negatively to Cedar's description of the council as a tree. Cedar is an elder who is Jaden's mentor. And the ideas at the end of this next section may seem complex, but they're ne a necessary segue into our final concept of conjunction and the alchemical hermaphrodite. So just bear with me for a moment here. Jaden said nothing. Finally, instead of choosing, she challenged Cedar. What, why has the council not initiated everyone? Why is every man, woman, and child not on your tree, not privileged to eternal life? We are the elite, Jaden. We are the alchemist council and our responsibility to the world is unfathomable to the uninitiated. Expand the tree, save the world. The council is all the tree can sustain. 101 is constant, that is all. When one is erased, we add another by necessity, but the tree is best renewed through alchemical conjunction. When two alchemists conjoin, we sustain the tree with one new life, a new initiate. The enhanced quintessence of our conjoined pendants infuses the council with power coursing through the tree to and from the lapis like elixir itself. A space is created both physically and alchemically for an initiate whose longing for quintessence is satisfied by the abundance created through conjunction. One of the most prominent and important concepts in alchemy is known as the alchemical hermaphrodite. Its importance is on par with the philosopher's stone and indeed it often represents the stone. We'll look at various illustrations of the figure shortly, but first I need to explain an associated concept, that of conjunction. In medieval and early modern alchemy, conjunction is a stage in the multi-staged process leading to the creation of the philosopher's stone. As Lindy Abraham explains, 
when discussing conjunction. Alchemy is based on the hermetic view that man had become divided within himself, separated into two sexes at the fall of the Garden of Eden and could only regain his integral Adamic state when the opposing forces within him were reconciled. <clears throat> Alchemical conjunction is defined by Gareth Roberts as the mixture or union of elements or substances figured as marriage, copulation, uniting of male and female or brother and sister or king and queen sometimes to form an androgen or as it is alternatively called within alchemical literature and scholarship, the alchemical hermaphrodite. In my academic work, as you saw earlier, I explored the significance of the hermaphrodite in detail. And thus I wanted to ensure that the concept remains central within the alchemy of the Alchemist Council. So I'm gonna show you now just a series of images from various manuscripts to illustrate the prevalence of the concept. And then I'll read two passages from the Alchemist Council to illustrate my interpretation of this key component. <clears throat> so here we have the Amphitheatrum Sapientiae Eternae, and I'm going to show a close-up of that central image. So you can see that figure at the bottom of the screen looks like two people conjoined. Their body is one, but they have two heads. But you see right at the bottom of the torso, the word rebus, R-E-B-I-S. And that concept is another word for the alchemical hermaphrodite. It's this conjoined figure. The rebus represents the union of opposites. It's one of the most famous symbols in alchemy. And it is, in fact, the much coveted goal of the Opus Alchemicum. That is, it's the goal of what is known as the great work of alchemy. So here, this is what happens in most of the manuscripts, that initially you have two figures, male and female. These ones happen to look sort of like Adam and Eve, given that they're standing by this tree. But the male, you can see, is associated with the sun and the woman with the moon. And eventually, as they go through their alchemical process, so this is later in the same manuscript, they become this single figure. The stages can perhaps be better illustrated here in the Rosarium Philosophorum, and there are numerous manuscripts of this text. Uh, this one happens to have little um, write-ups with each illustration. So initially, then, the king and queen are just there together, and then they take their clothes off as in the next scene, the king and queen disrobe. And then they have sex. In this case, it's called conception, but I just want to show you illustrations of the same stage in two other manuscripts. So it's generally referred to as coitus. And sometimes they look like they're already starting to conjoin, but at other times, it just looks like they're having sex of some sort within an alchemical vessel. But then they become this figure, the hermaphrodite upon the crescent moon. Or in the same manuscript, a few illustrations later, it's also represented as the soul child born of conjunction between the sun and the moon. And someone has glossed this manuscript with the, the demonstration of perfection. And then in, in Splendor Solus, it's a lot more elaborately illustrated, but in the end, these two figures end up as this angelic-looking figure of the rebus. So in the Alchemist Council, the act of conjunction is considered a sacrament, the purpose of which is to increase the power of the lapis. It involves a complex ritual performed by the council elders and by the end of the ritual, two alchemists have become one. However, they don't have two heads, as in these images. They appear as one being. And in all but one known case, and that case will be explored further in book two, by the end of con the conjunction ritual, 
one alchemist is dissolved into the other. And I'll read a passage first in which Cedar, who has conjoined with someone named Saul, is explaining this process or part of it to Jaden. We are conjoined as one alchemically. The rebus, every hermaphroditic image in the manuscripts is merely a figurative representation of an alchemical process. In conjunction, the stronger essence dissolves the weaker essence and in the process becomes even stronger. To put it in terms of a simple analogy, if you were to eat an apple, you would on some level conjoin with that apple, but when the process ends, you would remain you and the apple would be dissolved. Saul wasn't an apple, she was a human being. Conjunction is a sacrament, don't forget that, Jaden. One person dies. It's barbaric. Why haven't I learned this before today? So that discussion from chapter one leads Jaden to seek answers from the rebels. But I would also like to read you a passage from much later in the book in which a conjunction actually occurs between two characters named Amur and Sadira. As Jaden watched the ritual, she was saddened. She could not respond like the others. They appeared content, even joyous in their participation of the sacrament. But Jaden felt the chill of loss coursing through her. Only one would survive. Of the two, she would mourn the loss of Amur, but she would be distraught over the loss of Sadira. For the first several seconds, both Sadira and Amur cried out in pain. Jaden understood that conjunction took place on the elemental level, but from her perspective, from the perspective of one who watched the event from the sidelines with human senses alone, all Jaden witnessed was the gradual transition from flesh to fire. The two bodies appeared to burn white hot, separate at first, but finally melded together as one a glowing blue ember against the cliff face within the landscape's natural alembic structure. Though a human form was still vaguely discernible, Jaden could see no distinguishing features of either Sidira or Amur. She half expected the victorious one to emerge from the process of charred skeleton, one that would have to be healed through alchemical transmutation in a catacomb alembic. If this occurred, she would amend all her textbooks with marginal glosses depicting the reality of conjunction to counteract the council's official description of the splendor and sacrament. Feeling the need to brace herself, Jade impressed her back against the trunk of a tree. If only the tree were a portal. Gone were the beauty and effulgence of Madrona Hall within the harsh, hard shadows of the cliff face. Circe suddenly stood directly in front of her, the anticipation of the conjunction's near completion having urged him forward. Her hypocrisy abundantly evident, Jaden pushed him gently but firmly out of her line of vision. If she had to remain in council dimension, she wanted to be a full witness to this event. Jaden could hear the alchemically induced calls of crows and toads, their calls reverberating through the forest. Azoth Megan Alanthus drew forth the sword of the elixir. He stood sword aloft, reciting another passage of the sacrament. Finally, he plunged the sword into the blue glow of the ember. A final blast of light burst forth seconds later, revealing not a charred skeleton, but a resplendent human form, whole but not yet distinct in its detailed features, the rebus. A lot of controversy and deception surrounds the practice of conjunction in the Alchemist Council. And these issues will be explored further in the second book of the series, which will be out in 2018, tentatively entitled The Flaw in the Stone. It explores the mutual conjunction, that is, both people surviving in one body of two characters named Elix and Malia, who played a brief role in book one. But another alchemical concept is going to be the major feature of book two, and that is the homunculus, a miniature being created within the Alembic, which, as Lindy Abraham explains, symbolizes the fact that the alchemist's work involves the reproduction of God's very creation in microcosm in a little universe of the Alembic. 
And here is a close-up of one of the vessels from that manuscript. I have additional slides and points to make afterward, but I thought as the final Alchemist Council passage that I'll read to you today, I've selected something from book two, <clears throat> which is due at the publisher on October 17th. <laughs> so you're the first people who will hear this. <laughs> I'll be reading the final section of the prologue to book two, so you'll need a bit of context first. There's a new character named Genevere who lives in flaw dimension, and she has discovered that her blood is the key to opening a mysterious door in the rebel archives. The door leads to a manuscript room, and a door within that room leads to another manuscript room. And at this point, Genevere has already progressed through 10 rooms and now stands before a single manuscript whose pages are blank. Genevere trembled. Once again, she removed a piece of glass from her pocket, reopening her wound for the third time. She held her bleeding finger above the first folio while applying pressure with her thumbnail to ensure the release of a large drop of blood. At first, nothing happened, and she suddenly feared the repercussions if anyone were able to trace the manuscript defacement to her. But as the minutes passed, the folio began to bear forth its message. The illumination emerged first, rendered in dark crimson and gold. It featured what appeared to be a small being within an ancient alembic. Shortly thereafter, a few words appeared above the image. Their size, style, and placement suggested they formed a title, but Genevere could not read the ancient script in which the words were written. Congratulations, Genevere spun around. Dracane stood directly behind her. You have done what no high Azoth, including myself, has ever managed to do. Your bloodline alchemy is truly extraordinary. Genevere blushed, ashamed of being caught, but simultaneously proud of her individual accomplishment. You are no outside mere scribe, continued Dracane, but neither are you as yet an alchemist, rebel or otherwise. Thus, as high Azoth of the rebel branch, I must ask you to leave this chamber immediately. No! We will return here together one day, but for now, for your own safety and that of the entire flaw dimension, you must leave and allow the manuscript to mature. Mature? One by one over the years, three decades of the scriptural enigmas have been correctly interpreted. The words and illumination on each folio will emerge. We cannot risk contaminating the sacrament with your impatience. At least tell me what the words say. Genevere pointed to the letters inscribed above the image of the Alembic, now fully revealed and spectacularly vivid on the first folio. Dracane moved closer to the manuscript. He smiled and sighed, finally, finally. Finally, the rebel branch has gained an advantage over the Alchemist Council. Even if you choose to leave us on your day of decision, today you have repaid our hospitality beyond measure. The rebel branch will be forever grateful. With this manuscript, our greatest potential has begun to manifest. What do the words say? Roughly, Dracane began. He then paused as if pondering the translation options before announcing the manuscript's title solemnly, Formula for the Conception of the Alchemical Child. If today's talk has incited your curiosity about alchemy, I would recommend Adam McLean's website, Al the Alchemy website, as a starting point. You'll find vast amounts of information about alchemy on the site, including various courses and videos. There's 24 videos here, including one on the alchemical tree. And unlike my own work, which focuses on Middle English alchemy, McLean's site explores alchemy in various languages from various traditions. I'd also encourage you to view online alchemical manuscripts such as this one, Aurora Consurgens. If you go here, I know you can't see the URL, but you could email me if you'd actually like the URL. If you go here, you can actually turn the pages and you hear it. 
as you go, as if you're sitting there in the library. <laughs> and if all of that seems too complicated as a starting point, you can begin here. <laughs> I think this book attests to the fact that the popularity of this subject matter, or better yet, to learn about true alchemy, you could begin here. <laughs> And since you probably haven't learned to make gold from this presentation and will therefore have to pay for this, I thought I'd offer you a few reviews to aid your decision. And in the spirit of conjoining opposites, I'll offer you one that is negative and one that is positive. So here is my favorite negative review. I knew I was in trouble when the subject line of the discussion thread was books you couldn't finish. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> I've got one that I'm wondering if I'll ever want to finish, The Alchemist Council by Cynthia Masson. Incredibly interesting premise, the characters just, I don't connect with either the viewpoint character or any of the characters the viewpoint character interacts with. Really, never has immortality and vast cosmic power been more tedious and boring, which is a damn shame, because some of the ideas are as cool as hell. Okay, so thanks, Pyrofox, uh, anonymous negative reviewer. And to conjoin with that, though, I'll show you one of, there, there are many positive reviews, but I've just picked one of the shortest that I also just enjoy because of his enthusiasm. <laughs> so this is from, uh, on Amazon, by Alex Simmons, who's a real person, as I found out, because I wrote to thank him. New, fresh ideas and a compellingly different writing style. I really enjoyed this book. Masson's style is new, fresh, and unlike anything I've read before. The world she has imagined is fascinating and refreshingly new. A completely new direction. And not your run-of-the-mill fantasy novel. The story is well-paced and the characters well-developed. A little hard to follow at the very beginning, but from page 25 on, I couldn't put it down. Okay, so I hope you'll agree there with Alex rather than Pierre Fox. <laughs> so to end with some medieval literature, I offer you a few lines from Chaucer's Troilus and Cresside. Here Chaucer is sending his little book, as he calls it, out into the world. Little is relative, it's 8,000 lines of Middle English poetry. And he says, go little book, go min, Go little mean tragedy, but subject bay to all a poesy. And kiss the steppes, whereas thou seest pass Virgil, Ovid, Omer, Lucan, and Stasa. On the one hand, Chaucer is being humble by kissing the steps of Virgil, Ovid, and Homer. On the other, he appears to be hoping that his book shares the same elixir of everlasting life. And on that note, let me show you where the Alchemist Council is shelved at the chapters in Nanaimo. <laughs> Thanks to the wonderful coincidence that Martin is close to Masson alphabetically, the Alchemist Council is kissing the steps of the Game of Thrones. Go forward, little book. If, if you don't want to go all the way to chapters, the book is actually available here on campus at the campus bookstore. But I would like to end by asking you to join me in the Oath of the Alchemists, which appears at the beginning of the book. And I'll just let your eyes adjust to this font for a moment, and then we'll begin. And you can follow me with the hand gestures as well, if you would like if you're worthy, of course, to turn the page. All right, so please join me. Drink of this, the elixir. Read of this, the word eternal. From the lapis to the scribe, from the scribe to the reader. Long live the quintessence. Long live the Alchemist Council. Yeah, yes, <laughs> thank you.